Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be here with you and with the amazing Jennifer and Seamus, who were able to join us at our first virtual summit last year. Um, if you are comfortable, please feel free to post your name, pronouns, and where you're Zooming in from in the chat. It's actually been really exciting. We've had people from all over the country and even outside of the country join us. Um, so we're always really excited. Oh, we have someone from Georgia. I'm also on the East Coast. Ooh, Ashlyn. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. As you join, feel free to continue to tell us where you're zooming in from. Um, so we're just going to get started. Um, I first want to introduce our two amazing guests today. Um, we are going to be talking about their book, Sexual Citizens. So Jennifer Hirsch is a professor, professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia's um, Mailman School of Public Health. And Seamus Khan is a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University. Um, they are co-authors of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex power and assault on campus. I'm sure many people joining us have already checked out that book if you have not highly, highly recommend. Um, it is uh, a really fantastic book with a lot of really good descriptions of uh, that are relevant to this field. Um, the research presented in Sexual Citizens was realized as part of Columbia's Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, um, or SHIFT as they call it, that was co-directed by Jennifer and uh, a clinical psychologist, uh, Claude Ann Mellons. Um, so I just, before we get started, want to provide a contact content warning. Um, and Adriana, if you could post some resources in the chat, that would be really helpful as well. Um, the, you know, we just want everyone to note that the discussion of sexual citizens will contain descriptions of sexual assaults, um, as students have experienced them. The material can be hard to listen to, and we know that um, there may be survivors on today's call. So um, please feel free to, actually, I will go ahead and drop the RAIN hotline. Adriana, if you're able to drop others. Oh, there we go. Um, thanks so much. Perfect, and then here is RAIN. Um, great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Jennifer, Seamus. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and Adriana, if you could pin the three of us, that would be fantastic. Adriana is our amazing newest team member that is here to help us on the tech side of things. Um, as we have this conversation, if at any point anyone feels like they need to turn their screen off or um, just step away for a minute or leave and then join again, you are more than welcome to. That is fine. We can admit people until the end. Um, we do also want to let you know that this, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we are not going to save the chat. However, we are going to post the meeting um, on our YouTube channel at the end in case folks missed it. Um, if you have any questions throughout or comments, please feel free to engage in the chat. Um, we try to be as engaged as possible in the chat since this is a virtual conversation and we couldn't be in person. So please feel free to use that. Um, if anyone has trouble with the chat, um, please reach out to Adriana or to me and we'll, we'll try to troubleshoot. Um, there we go. Um, all right, so with that, let's get started. Um, so Jennifer and Seamus, let's just get into it. Can you tell us a little bit about this shift study that um, I just mentioned? Um, what is it? 
And why did you decide to write Sexual Citizens? Sure. Um, so actually, I'm going to open uh, Sylvia with a story because, as you know from having read the book, um, it's very narrative driven. And so we want to bring everyone in the Zoom room into the feeling of being, um, being in the book. Um, when Lucy arrived on campus, um, she hadn't had a lot of sexual experience. She'd gone to boarding school and been pretty sheltered, one of those super strict boarding schools, not, not the other kind. Um, and uh, she was clear about uh, what she wanted to get out of college in terms of her sexual and social life, or what we um, will explain later we call a sexual project. She wanted to meet some boys, um, make out, and eventually lose her virginity. And so she was pretty excited when a girl on her hall asked if she wanted to go out to one of the local bars uh, during orientation week. Um, they were not 21, but it's not so hard to get into a bar in Morningside Heights um, as a girl. And so, uh, which is what women on campus are called. And so they went and um, it felt very exciting when some seniors started to chat them up. And um, Scott uh, bought Lucy some drinks, they danced a little, and then he asked her if she wanted to go back to the fraternity with him. Um, and she did, she, she was enjoying his attention and she was enjoying talking with him. Um, and so they, they walked back up Amsterdam Avenue in the warm summer night. Um, her phone was ringing and ringing um, and Scott was just kind of like, keep going, but she, she answered and it turned out it was Nancy who was, um, had gotten that bystander intervention and was trying to check up and make sure her friend was okay. And so they waited outside the fraternity for Nancy to catch up um, and then they went inside. Scott asked them if they'd like a drink um, and they said yes. Now fraternities, um, are not allowed to serve hard alcohol, but it doesn't mean they don't, it just means they keep it upstairs. And so they went upstairs to the second floor. So like stop and picture the scene for a minute. Um, two young women recently arrived on campus, not a dense social network in a building they've never been in where the person who's hosting them is surrounded by his friends on a campus where he's been now for three years, he's got a lot more sexual experience, um, he's got a lot more alcohol experience, um, and he knew what he wanted. He asked uh, Lucy if she wanted to go upstairs to his bedroom and she thought they were just gonna make out. So yeah, sure, she did want to go up to his bedroom and it, it was fine until it wasn't fine. Um, he started to unbutton her pants and she said, no, don't, to which he said, it's okay. And then it wasn't okay. Um, you can imagine the rest of the story. I don't need to, to, to trace it out for you. Um, and your take in hearing that story may be Scott's a terrible person. Um, and because that's what most of the conversation has been. And that's not a bad take. Certainly what he did was a terrible thing. And yet when we began the research that we share in Sexual Citizens, most of the conversation around campus sexual assault was focused either on improving adjudication processes, which is very important, um, but only a tiny fraction of assaults are reported. And so that's not gonna lead us into a world with fewer assaults, or else they were focused on the idea of campuses as a hunting ground, the idea that if we could just find the people who do what Scott did and throw them out of our communities, everything would be okay. Um, we have a very different take in sexual citizens. Our goal with the book is to change the national conversation to a really radical vision of what prevention needs to look like. Um, and that means approaching the topic with empathy and hope for all of the students who shared their stories with us and also thinking about how sexual assault, rather than focusing on bad people, think about how sexual assault is actually built into the campus environment, which sounds kind of grim until you see that once you see how it's built in, you could think about what it would, what is required to build it out, to engineer it out, to build campuses where, where all students can thrive. 
So Claude and I, big project, we could talk about research methods another time. We started this very big project and Seamus and I collected the data for um, one component of the project and that is the work that we share in Sectoral Citizens. Um, thanks so much. Would definitely love to talk about uh, that research and data at some point. Jennifer, it sounds really important, uh, really interesting. Um, but moving on, um, so we know that the book is centered around three big ideas, sexual citizenship, uh, sexual products, projects, sorry, and sexual geographies. Um, these are the lens through which you make sense of sexual assaults. Can you share a bit about how these ideas interact with each other? Sure. Um, like Jennifer, I'll uh, tell this through a story. Um, so Charisma described Columbia as a white institution. And what she meant by that in her words were that it was filled with um, guys who couldn't dance, drank too much, listened to shitty music, and didn't find her attractive. Um, and she was a woman on color who just didn't feel like she really had a place on campus. And so she ended up meeting a guy through her roommate. And after texting back and forth for a couple weeks, she decided to go out to Brooklyn to meet him. And it was kind of a, you know, Brooklyn's not very far from Morningside Heights. It's only about nine miles, but like the subways weren't running and it was sort of a disastrous trip. It took her hours to get out there. It was pouring rain. She ended up like getting to his apartment soaking wet and she peeled off her clothes, you know, they smoked a joint, she had a drink and um, they started making out and everything was fine until he started to put his hands on her body and she moved his hands away and he put them right back. And reflecting upon this charisma told us, I never really had a plan B. Like my plan A was always body language and it had worked out for me. Charisma told us then about having sex with him twice, even though once she clearly said no, and um, verbally, so beyond the no of moving his hands away. And she rationalized that he must have heard her as being, you know, uncomfortable because they were repositioned. Um, that's what, that was his solution to hearing her no. Now, again, like the Scott and Lucy story that Jennifer told, you could hear this and think, what a terrible guy that guy is. And like Jennifer said, it's not a bad take, uh, but it doesn't get us to a path of prevention. And instead, we use these three ideas, Sylvia, the um, sexual projects, sexual citizenship, and sexual geographies to sort of read through this story a little bit differently. So sexual projects emerges out of some of Jennifer's earlier work, and it's the answer to the question, what is sex for? And you might think only two academics could ask a question like, what is sex for? Um, but as it turns out, it's a really important question because what, figuring out what people are trying to do with their sexual lives helps us understand the sexual contexts and situations that they're in. In both the stories we just told, the sex that the young people were having was consensual until it wasn't. And so an analysis of sexual situations is really important. Young people have sex for lots of different reasons. So do old people. They have it to, for sexual pleasure, but a lot of sex isn't that sex pleasurable. They have it to come to identify their own identities. So for a lot of queer students, we heard about sex as a project of self-discovery. They use sex um, to have some new experience, to increase the status that they have within the group that they're in or the status of their group overall. There are lots of things that we're trying to do. If we think about this story of charisma, you know, charisma lacked a lot of clarity in her sexual project. And it wasn't her fault. It was instead the fault of the communities that raised her. Communities that actually, instead of wanting to talk about sex and what sex was for, produced sexual silence. And in our analysis in the book, one of the things Jennifer and I claim is that people's inability to actually talk about sex in the moment that they're having sex is produced by those silences. Sexual citizenship is the idea that people have the right to say yes and the right to say no to the sex that they want to have and an obligation to recognize similar rights in others. Um, the really sort of, you know, the part that we push pretty hard is that people have the right to say yes to sex. And so if we as communities raise young people without that sense, then we're really underserving them. Now, in the story that we tell with Charisma and that young man, he had an incredibly clear sense of his right to say yes to sex. 
but he had a totally impoverished sense of charisma's equivalent rights. He did not view her as an equivalent human being who had the same rights that he did. And that failure of sexual citizenship really laid the groundwork for that assault. Jennifer and I analyze sexual citizenship and note how men frequently have a highly developed sense of their own right to sexual self-determination and frequently have an impoverished sense of other people's basic equality of rights. Women, by contrast, frequently experience sexual citizenship where they, they're not really told that they have the right to their to own sexual self-determination. And then we do analyses of multiple other identities, gender identities and sexual identities, and note how sexual silence and shame is instrumental in denying young people, queer people, trans people's sexual citizenship. The final piece of the story is sexual geographies. And, you know, I started the story with saying Columbia was a white space, not just for kind of effect and to get a smile, but instead as part of our key analytic framework within the book, which is that space matters. It's not just a backdrop, it's a central to the experience of sex and sexuality. Sex and assaults happen in particular kinds of spaces. And space isn't a benign sort of landscape. Instead, it's infused with power inequalities. So there are multiple dimensions of space that matter in that story. The first is, she, Charisma was in that guy's apartment, just as in Jennifer's story, Lucy was in Scott's space. And so the control over space on campus really matters. The second part of space that's really important is to think about how men, and typically white men on many campuses, have overwhelming control over the spaces of socialization. When Charisma said that the, the party scene on campus was dominated by men who drank too much, couldn't dance, listened to shitty music, and didn't find her attractive, that was partially a problem for her because they dominated the social space, that the, the, the fraternity scene and the control over space was dominated by them. And so this analytic provides us with sort of new levers of intervention, which is not to say we need to take all the space away from white men, but we may instead want to think about how space and inequality are essential to understanding assault and that if we wanna think about assault as being the product of power inequalities, we might wanna consider its multiple dimensions and its spatial dynamics. Oh, I wanna say one last thing that I forgot, and I just wanna layer this on. There's a third part of the charisma story that really matters in terms of space and power, which was that charisma was not from a wealthy family. And so where other students may have been able to like open up a ride app and get a car to whisk them away from Brooklyn back to Morningside Heights, it's like a $50, $60 cab ride and she couldn't afford it. And so another dimension of power is of course class within that story. Um, thanks so much for mentioning that, especially that last piece, Seamus, that's extremely important. Um, you know, in the, in the book, you talk about sex education as necessary for preventing sexual assault. Um, so could you both talk a little bit about uh, what you learned about the importance of sex education through this study? Sure. I mean, I think a big takeaway is that the way we, um, the way that we want people to think about prevention is that it's vital to go beyond campus and before campus. Um, when students roll up on campus and they get an hour long session um, that basically conveys that they shouldn't assault each other, but it's the first conversation that they've ever had about sex, that's not gonna take us where we need to be. So we asked um, the students that we interviewed about their experiences with, sexual, with sex education and mostly they laughed and they were like, oh, you mean the sexual diseases class that we got. Um, so the the, the landscape of sex education in America is very unequal. Um, and uh, some students, a minority had gotten very good age appropriate, medically accurate, comprehensive sex education, but mostly they had not. And remember that, that um, well, mostly they had not. Um, and this was even more acutely true for queer students who, all of whom, to, to a person, said that the sex education that they had gotten 
um, ignored them, was just totally irrelevant. And so it didn't just convey the message that um, they shouldn't have sex right now, that they should have sex later, um, and that if they were gonna have sex now, these are some ways to do it, but really they shouldn't have sex now. Um, instead, it conveyed the message that the sex that they wanted was never gonna be legitimate. Um, so they felt um, it, it attacked and erased by those experiences of sex education. Um, so that's, that was the current state, but in the survey, we asked students um, if they'd had sex education before campus um, that included training and how to say no to sex they didn't want to have, which is not abstinence only sex education. It's just sex education that includes a skill development component. And the women who had had that kind of sex education were half as likely to be raped in college. That is a big effect size. If you remember back to a year ago when we were still praying for COVID vaccines, we were hoping for a vaccine that would be 50% effective. And sex education is essentially a vaccine that is about 50% effective in preventing sexual assaults. Now, obviously our goal should be to teach people not to assault other people rather than focusing on teaching people to defend themselves from assault. Um, other work that I've done suggests that sex education could do that too. Um, so if you think, for example, think about driving, right? That's like a pretty dangerous thing that people do um, that's seen as um, in many parts of America, part of the emergence into adulthood. But we don't just let keys, we don't just let kids grab the keys when they're drunk and sort of like look over our shoulder and be like, well, I hope that works out for them. Instead, there's a whole system making sure that people learn how to drive safely so that they can get where they're going without getting hurt and without hurting other people. And sex education is essentially that same thing, but for sex. So in some way, like one main takeaway from the book is that we shouldn't be surprised that people hurt each other through sex because we're not teaching them not to do that. So sex education is a fundamental element, not the only element, but has to be a fundamental element of um, the prevention work that we do in our communities. And just like one further thing that I would mention is it is astonishing. There are still states in America that mandate by law that if sex education is provided, it must discriminate against queer students. That if, if teachers give any sex education, they're not allowed to say anything positive about homosexuality. So we have a lot of work to do, first of all, in making sure that people have, everyone has access to comprehensive sex ed, but also in making sure that the sex ed that's taught is inclusive. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, we have definitely heard a lot of students come to us and, and say, uh, similar things about not feeling included in the prevention programs that they have received in college, um, even before college, um, if there was anything before college. Um, so we definitely, you know, we feel lucky to be partners with you because we have um, that same thought that if we can provide as much prevention um, as possible, that this will be such a better world. Um, and thank you to both of you for, for posting those resources in the chat. Hope everyone is able to click those. Um, so moving on a little bit um, into, into the, the details of the book, um, I'm really glad that both of you are centering this conversation in, in the stories of survivors. Um, it makes it both extremely relatable and uh, that is the most important conversation to have. So in the book, you tell the story of a, um, a young man that realizes that he's talking to you, that he has well, realized as he is talking to you that he has committed an assault. Um, along with the need for sex education, this story and others in the book highlight the need for conversations about restorative and transformative justice. 
Um, I will plug that we have a conversation on this tomorrow as part of our summit. Please sign up. Um, and <laughs> also taking into consideration the calls to defund and abolish the police, gaining recent mainstream attention. Um, so can you speak more to these ideas and how we as a society should consider shaping sexual citizens um, with a new set of values? Absolutely. You know, that story is the story of Austin, who was a really kind of compelling um, interview subject. He, the one sort of steamy sex scene in the book is with him and his girlfriend. And, um, uh, you know, it's over summer on July 4th. And I'll just say, you know, they make their own fireworks. And, um, you know, he told us about how important his girlfriend's sexual pleasure was to him. They had different, he and his girlfriend had different nicknames for the different kinds of orgasms that she had. But he also told us about a weird sexual experience that he had his first year on campus. And the story was basically that he ended up in this woman's room because his roommate was hooking up with her girlfriend. I mean, her, her roommate, excuse me. And so he got sort of shuttled out of his room so that his roommate could have sex with his, his roommate's girlfriend into the girlfriend's room where this woman was sleeping. And he opened the door and she said, she was pretty drunk and she said to him, I don't really wanna do anything. And like, step back, like imagine a stranger walks into your room and the first thing you say is, I don't really wanna do anything. I mean, it tells us something about the culture of college early on to begin with, but he didn't listen to her and he got into bed and he started to touch her body. And then he stopped, he sort of said, this isn't really the thing. and. Um, Initially, he described it as a weird encounter. And later in the interview, we asked him, as we asked all students, what is sexual assault? And he said, well, it's any unwanted sexual contact. And he kind of paused and his eyes welled up and he said, fuck me. Because he'd realized in, that, in the interview, it was kind of the first time he'd realized that what he'd done wasn't weird, it was an assault. And, you know, he was having a really hard time sort of, figuring out like how it was that he could have committed an assault because of who he, he, he'd like understood himself to be as a young man and who, you know, who he understood himself to be as a boyfriend to his girlfriend, who he understood himself to be as a person. We tell that story. We tell another story of a young man named Adam in the book. I don't know why Adam and Austin are both in this answer. Maybe I'm just thinking in terms of A's. And Adam grew up in a very, very conservative household um, where they didn't accept his sexuality and he couldn't be out. He was thrilled to move to New York. But then he got to New York and he was like, wow, the New York gay scene actually isn't that great because Adam really wanted a relationship. And he kept meeting guys online who would like tell him they wanted a relationship, hook up with him and then ghost him. And he found this like really unpleasant. And he eventually had a boyfriend and the boyfriend was very meaningful. And he really, he really like, you know, was committed to his relationship, except he told us, you know, the problem is sometimes he's really forceful um, about sex. And then Adam told us the story about how his boyfriend came home one night and in Adam's words, he basically raped me. And his boyfriend had come home drunk and forced Adam to have sex. Now, I tell these stories because so much of the attention on sexual assault is like, what can we do after it happens? And it, that sort of operates under the fantas two fantasies. The first fantasy is like, we hear about most of the assaults that happen. And in almost every story we've told, um, none of the people reported those experiences of assault to anyone but us in the interview. Charisma had never told her story as assault. Lucy, in the first story that Jennifer told, told her friends that she had like a wild, fun sexual experience because she didn't really want to process it as an assault. It was just one of those wild freshman year things that happened. Um, uh, uh, Adam didn't want to talk to his friends about his boyfriend and sex because of how harmful um, he thought it would, would be towards his boyfriend. He thought all of his friends would hate the boyfriend and never want to talk to him again and ostracize him from the community. And of course, Austin never told anyone he assaulted anyone because he hadn't realized it until the moment he sat down with us. So like the idea that we can respond to assaults after they happen and that that will change behavior is truly naive. 
And it's part of a broader understanding that like we can punish our way out of social problems. And Jennifer and I are really sort of informed deeply by the United States' really disastrous experience with mass incarceration and the negative consequences that that has. And our position is not, let me be absolutely clear, that we shouldn't punish anyone for committing an assault. That is not our position. Our position is, is that we should spend way more time thinking about what community development looks like so that assaults are less likely to happen in the first place. This is a classic approach to that, that public health takes, which is that like, if there's polluted water, one of the things that you do is like, not just think, how do I treat the water? Like, how do I treat the water before? It's like, you move way upstream and you're like, what is polluting this water? Like, where is this coming from? And what could we do to take those advanced steps? Our approach is really a multi-sectoral response. So we don't think that like the prevention is all we need, that we don't need any punishment, that we don't need any adjudication. If we can just prevent, everything will go away. But we do think that like if fewer than 5% of assaults are being reported, responding to them after they happen misses 95% of them to begin with. And people don't really respond that much to punishments and aggressive punishments. It doesn't move the needle on behavior. We've got to ask, how do we move the needle on behavior? And luckily, public health has a lot of insights on how to do that. Sexual geographies is actually a huge part of that story. Uh, thank you so much, Seamus. I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, I, I think it is really important to understand that we can't be having this conversation without acknowledging that there um, is a conversation to be had when we talk about survivors, about also the harm doers. And if we don't talk about that, we are missing an entire part of this conversation. Um, so thanks for for, for mentioning that. Um, you know, I, let's see here. So you talk about the role of power in sexual assault. Can you speak to um, what you were able to reveal about the way that race, um, as you mentioned a little bit about sexual orientation, gender identity and other social identities um, can influence the likelihood of a sexual assault? How much time do you have? Um, we have so much to say about this. And I just, I want to flag, I'm sure you, Sylvia, have seen the T-video and probably there are other people on this webinar who've seen the T-video. And some people are like, oh, that's so cute. It's animated and a little bit funny. Um, but the problem with the T-video is that they're stick figures, right? There's no gender, there's no class, there's no race. And so it treats um, consent as just a verbal interaction as opposed to something that's situated in a field of power relations. Um, and you know, the classic feminist analyses of campus sexual assault focus on gender, on, on the power that men on campus have collectively over women as the fundamental dimension of inequality. And that is really important, but it's also profoundly incomplete. And so the analysis of power that we bring to the problem in sexual citizens, um, the title of that chapter is Gender and Beyond. Um, and so I'm actually gonna lean into the beyond part. Um, every single black woman that we spoke with, um, every single one, reported experiencing unwanted, non-consensual sexual touching. For most of them, that just sort of like came up in the course of a conversation. That wasn't even what they talked about when we asked them if they'd ever been assaulted because it was that sort of quotidian disrespect, disregard of their right to physical self-determination was um, a part of daily life for them in a very hard way, but something that they and the people around them had come to see as um, maybe not normal, but but inevitable. So you can't, I mean, also, have you been to America, right? You like fundamentally can't think about sexual violence without thinking about race. And in fact, we would argue also that you can't think about America without thinking about sexual, without thinking about racialized sexual violence. Um, 
The same is true um, in different ways uh, for black men um, who, you know, all of the men that we spoke with had a fear of being falsely accused. But for the black men that we spoke with, there was it was the way that they spoke about that fear reflected their broader experience of precarity. Um, I think about uh, Carl's story. Carl um, was very clear that he never had sex while he was drunk because it felt to him too dangerous. Um, and in fact, he told us a story about meeting a girl at a party and she seemed into him. She clearly, uh, wanted to have sex with him, but she, to him, was too drunk. And so they walked around, you know, they left the party, they walked around, they walked around till like four in the morning until she was like less drunk and then went back to his room. And then she still seemed maybe a little too drunk to him. So they waited a little, they, he sort of like stalled. And then when he was, he felt like she was sober enough to have sex, they had sex. But also as she was leaving, he recorded her without asking her permission saying that she'd had a good time with him. Um, and as he described to us in the interview, he had checked and knew that in New York, a recording made without the other person's permission was admissible as evidence in court. So like, think about how nervous he must have been. Um, and then step back and think about the history of black men having sex with white men in America, with white women in America. And you can see that that nervousness is not about only his experiences on the Columbia campus, it's about his experiences as a black man in America. So a thing to take away from that actually is not just about the precarity that black men experience, but about the obliviousness to their own power that white men experience. Because, you know, the conversation around alcohol and campus sexual assault, frequently people are like, oh, if you drink too much, you're vulnerable to being assaulted. But our take is actually, if you are a white man and you drink so much, you're vulnerable to assaulting someone. Think back to Scott, right? He, in that interaction, maybe he wasn't super drunk, but he was not attentive to the power dynamics. Um, and so the fact that black men typically drink less might in some ways be protective for them against actually assaulting someone because they see that as a dangerous, they recognize the danger in that behavior. And Seamus, I don't know if you want to uh, build on, talk about uh, some of the uh, queer stories, um, just in general, I'm passing the torch to you here. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, we sort of, I very briefly told the story of Adam, who, um, you know, that experience of being able to express himself sexually with his partner, um, his inability to do that is partially built on a context of sexual silence and shame from his family. I mean, he did not have a sense of his own sexual citizenship in part because like as a gay man, any sex that he was going to have was illegitimate. So he was like never legitimate in having the kinds of sex that he wanted to have. But among queer students, you know, we, we saw as is consistent with so many other studies that queer students have some of the highest rates of sexual violence among any po uh, population. And, you know, we, we can't really rely upon hegemonic masculinity or toxic masculinity to explain that. What, what's happening in part is that um, queer students are experiencing sort of the systematic power inequalities that black women are experiencing and that disabled students are experiencing, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, in some of the stories that we heard about assaults uh, uh, within the queer population, so one story, um, was the story of Maddie, who um, was assigned male at birth, and over the course of uh, her time in college was transitioning in her gender identity. And um, she'd first met her girlfriend and um, began her transition during the course of the relationship. And Maddie really didn't want to use her penis during sex because penal vaginal intercourse for her was like, it, it was completely invalidating of her entire identity. Um, but Maddie's partner pressured her over and over and over again to have penal vaginal sex. And Maddie described it as a war of attrition. And she said like, her wants overtook my needs and she was suddenly no longer able, she felt, to um, 
have the kinds of sex that she wanted and she understood it as an assault. In another story, um, a genderqueer student whose partner was also going through gender, identi uh, uh, gender identity transition yet to fully identify themselves in a particular way at that moment, their partner said to them when they didn't want to have sex, oh, you don't think I'm beautiful. And, you know, the student said, like, I knew how deep it cut. And when you're going through this kind of transition with friends, family, you know, in the world to feel like because you're going through a transition in your gender identity, people don't think you're beautiful. And so they ended up having sex with their partner. Now, these were conditions of like kind of duress. Um, in the former case, it was, in the, I mean, sorry, in the latter case that you don't think I'm beautiful. It's very much about um, in some ways queer solidarity um, uh, drove them to engage in things that they didn't want to. But if your analytic is just masculinity and power, you're not going to really be able to see or read those experiences. And again, I want to be clear, like, Jennifer and I are not denying the existence of gender and power. We actually think it's 100% right. What we're doing is layering onto it two things. The first is developments in our understanding of gender over the last 30 years, where we don't think about gender as totally independent of other relationships. We think about it intersectionally. So an analysis of gender and power has to think about sexuality, race, gender identity, class, ability, and all kinds of other dimensions of power inequalities. The second is that like, if you think that power is essential to understanding assault, then you need to understand the multiple forms of power that exist on campus. And what this means for us is like, it's not just sort of an academic exercise of laying intersectionality on top of our analysis or like making things more complicated, which is actually something that academics love to do, to be like, oh, it's more complicated than that. What it is, is it, we try to turn this in the work into a kind of a call to arms, which is to say that if you think that power is essential to understanding assault, then one of the projects that we have to do as part of our prevention is commit ourselves broadly to equality on campus and to build alliances and relationships with other people who are doing parallel work. Because if we go back to the first story gender, uh, uh, Jennifer told in answering this question, like racial justice is a sexual assault prevention strategy. If every black woman is being is having their body touched because their their colleagues fundamentally don't recognize them as having the same rights to their body and the same fundamental hum humanity, then the education that we have to provide isn't just about consent. It's instead working with our colleagues in sort of the multicultural center and saying, we want to partner with you because the work that you're doing towards building campuses of equal where equality is central is something that we also are doing as prevention people, just as it means partnering with the people in the Queer Student Association, in you know, the Korean Students Association, in all kinds of associations on campus. Um, thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to everyone who is posting questions in the chat, either publicly or privately, um, really appreciate that. I think we might have time for two of those questions. Um, there is so much we could say on this topic, um, but I do, I think I'm going to ask you one more question and then see if we can go to the audience questions, if that's okay. Um, okay, um, because I think this is such an important question what strategies do you recommend campus and community advocates implement moving forward to combat sexual violence? Um, so there's two buckets there. There's the bucket of things that have to happen off campus and before campus. And so certainly comprehensive sex ed, that's the sort of community level intervention. Um, also families need to step up and, you know, we found, and, and other people have found this as well, like young people in America learn about sex through porn and that's because nobody else is teaching them, right? And so if parents need to have conversations, which is not lectures, but actual conversations 
with their children, um, if they want to convey their sex, their values about sexuality and relationships. And then every institution that touches people on their way to adulthood needs to step up, right? Like mostly when you think about religious institutions and sexual harm, the idea is that they should be spaces that are free from sexual harm, which, you know, hard agree on that. And also that's a pretty low bar for institutions that are supposed to have the mission of teaching people how to be good people in the world, right? So like what more relevant way to be a good person in the world than to understand how to have um, delightful, consensual, satisfying sex, right? With So um, th there are many, many things before campus. And then on campus, I think remembering that our A game in public health is not yakking at people to act better, but it's changing the context, changing the environment. And so there we get back to the idea of sexual geographies. Um, and the challenge there is, is for people, and this can't just be the people who do the sexual assault prevention, because they typically don't have the power to allocate any space on campus, but bringing in stakeholders who shape housing policy and who shape access to social space um, and thinking about ways that the allocation of space on campus could um, mitigate inequalities as opposed to making them worse. So like one very concrete example, because I feel like I'm a little bit talking in the clouds here. Um, we all assume when you get on campus that like freshmen should have the worst spaces and seniors should have the best spaces. And that's not just true of students. I mean, both Seamus and I have seen colleagues cry because they feel like the office they were assigned doesn't reflect how powerful they feel they are. So the idea that space equals power is very taken for granted. Think even of like the phrase, the corner office, right? So people expect space to reflect their power. But what that does is it means we put first year students in spaces where they can have sex privately and they don't have enough room to host parties. So we built a system that drives them out of the places where they're most at home into places that are controlled by older students. That is not inevitable as a feature of college. That's something that reflects the intersection of housing policy and social policies. And so you could undo that. There's one campus that we're in conversations with that actually changed um, the room draw policy so that rather than having the team captains get access to the suites in the best dorm, um, it was the students who had the highest GPAs. Now, like, I'm not sure, we're not sure really that that is where we would go. I would allocate those spaces to first gen low income students, right? And be like, and like, say, we are centering you on our campus and you are the students who we want to do extra work to make sure that you feel like you belong and that you can choose the music and you can host the parties as opposed to having to like suck off to some Scott-like person to get some crappy beer. Um, so thinking about how to reimagine campus social and house housing space, that is really, that's the first place that we would go. And then there are all kinds of other things that we would do. Um, we're actually working on developing a tool that campuses can use to try to move forward in a really concrete way uh, with this, uh, with reimagining campus sexual geographies. And so, uh, Seamus and I will will drop a link in the chat if people want to um, be signed up to learn more about that. Seamus, I'm sure you may add on other things in terms of the what people should do. Yeah, and I, I just want to quickly add that the tool that we're developing is free and open source. So it's not like something people will have to pay for. It's um, something that we're developing that anybody on any campus can download for totally free, no obligation to do anything. So um, uh, um, uh, just, just to be clear, <laughs> um, uh, not a revenue stream for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think... Um, uh, you know, the, the other thing to think about is that, um, you know, the, the campus work that we're doing is so important, but um, especially for campus ad, ad advocates out there or um, students, like I, 
really would encourage, and those of us working with students, um, a focus on like a lot of our activism happening and being targeted at younger ages. Um, our work supports and provides further evidence to a lot of previous work that basically shows that um, one of the strongest predictors for being assaulted in college is being assaulted in high school. And um, the interventions that we have right now, it's not that they're too late, but they're kind of too late for a lot of people. Um, and so I think thinking on a kind of broader national scale that tries to reach everyone can be really helpful. And that one of the things that we can do as a campus is leverage our power as institutions within communities to try and realize that goal. And it may seem like naive and silly to say, well, we haven't cap solved the like, you know, campus sexual assault problem. So let's take on a bigger problem, which is like racial inequality, class inequality, and the lack of sex ed across the United States. Um, but Jennifer and I really do think like that's part of the big thinking that we have to do. Like it's it's part of what how we might target some of our approaches. And we need to recall that like people who are not in campus are are the evidence it seems to be more likely to experience assault than those people who are in campus. And so trying to imagine how we can leverage our power as um, in many of us don't feel very powerful, but as relatively um, uh, privileged people in the institutions that we're in to try and motivate young people and, the, and communities around us towards transformation. And as Jennifer said, I think the big thing that we would push towards is sex ed. And I see that there's a question in the chat about this. Like, you know, so Claire Griffin has asked, like, do you have any thoughts about doing prevention work in sex ed in our current political situation? I'm thinking of the increased scrutiny on educators and apparent groundswell of movements on school board meetings to dictate what can be taught and control access to medical care and information. And I think it's a really wonderful question. And I'm going to answer a little bit of it. And then I'm going to kick it back to you, Jennifer, because actually you do so much more work in this area um, uh, than I do. Um, I think that one of the really important things to think about with sex ed is that like sex ed is not just an education about sex. It's really an education about sort of fundamental skills building and life course education of young people. So sex ed at young ages, a lot of it is actually like something we already do, which is to tell young people, you know, you have the right to your own bodily autonomy. And if you want something, you don't just touch it or grab it or take it. You don't grab, you use your words. And I think um, one of the things that we might think about as part of our broad sexuality education is connecting um, lessons of sort of moral personhood and appropriate behavior that we're already giving young people to their sexual experiences, sort of building bridges between those lessons about fundamental bodily respect and then what they are doing in their own intimate and sexual lives. Because what we've largely done as a community is build firewalls between basic moral lessons about being a good person in the world and sexual behavior. And that firewall is because of sexual silence and shame. So I'll kick it to Jennifer here to maybe um, maybe want to push it further. I don't know. Well, I mean, I just, one thing that I would note is that um, across the, the political spectrum, um, parents actually really want their children to receive comprehensive sexuality education in school. Um, and so I think, you know, when we, we developed the curriculum, my husband and I, for our son's uh, K through eight elementary school, yes, you know, we are the, we were the sex ed family. Um, and every year, John meets with the parents to talk with them about what their children are going to be learning. And um, I think acknowledging that parents, that, that, that parents are our partners and that sex education doesn't actually take away from parents' role or guardians' role in shaping young people's values, but rather it does, you know, parents don't teach their kids math either, right? So like sex education delivers information and skills development, and then parents really are the ones, um, families whose job it is to convey um, values. So I guess we could talk till the cows come home about this, but um, 
Uh, those are just some thoughts. Um, okay, thank you both. I definitely want to be respectful of folks' time. I'm really realizing that we only have two minutes left, so we probably don't have time for one more question, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, <laughs> we um, had a question from the audience a bit early on um, that I think was uh, really great and both connects your book to a lot of our work as well. Um, so let's see, we had a question from Rachel. Sexual violence response and prevention efforts tend to be so separate from the work of comprehensively, uh, comprehensive sexual education. Is this your understanding and what do you make of that divide? Um, I think people who come into the work come in from different places, but we want to push back not just against that siloing, but against, you know, there's on most campuses, there's a whole different office of people who do work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And going back to our argument about power, you can't really do sexual assault prevention unless you situate that in the broader project of building campuses where all students feel a sense of citizenship. And so I think it's, so certainly as, as the um, question indicated, there is that siloing of people whose main focus is like sexual health and other people whose main focus is preventing sexual violence. But both the sexual health conversation and the sexual violence conversation sometimes forget the sexual citizenship question. They're both about avoiding bad things from happening in relation to sex when we know in public health that the way to bring people in is to help them imagine the things that they do want to have happen, including the kinds of sex that they want to be having. Um, so I think that that's potentially a bridge is to integrate sexual health and sexual violence by acknowledging that they're both fundamentally to move forward, need to engage people in a conversation about sex as actually potentially a good thing in their lives. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to just thank you both for um, participating in this really amazing conversation. It's always great to be on with you and um, to absorb some of your wisdom and lessons learned. Um, do either of you have any anything that you'd like to leave the audience with or any last words before we close off? No, I, I mean, I just want to thank you. And I think Jennifer said it early on, you know, really our approach is grounded in an understanding of empathy and hope um, rather than fear that like so much of the sex ed that people get so much of the experience of people working in this fear in, in this field, it's like, there's a lot of fear about this. And what we're hoping to do is push a little bit towards like a vision, an empathetic and hopeful vision of the things that we can do to sort of finally move the needle on the you know incredibly common experience of campus sexual assault. And I just want to close by encouraging you all, this is a little bit off topic, but we've just been through a mass death event of historic proportions. And I just want to remind you all to like please take care of yourselves, right? Not just hydrate and sleep, but like make space for processing what um, people are still living through in many parts of America and many parts of the world, um, there's no back to normal right now. And so I wanna hold space for, for the, the continued suffering of the pandemic in addition to the work that we need to do to prevent campus sexual assault. All right, well, thank you both so much. That's absolutely true. It bothers me so much when anyone says it it's over and we're back to normal. Absolutely not. No, it's not. Um, and uh, yes, also in, I very much encourage any sort of healing um, that works for each and every one of you. But thank you so much, Jennifer and Seamus. Really appreciate you. I hope everyone took advantage of all the resources that were posted in the chat. And I know that we are going to be having another conversation with you hopefully soon. Um, so thanks everyone and have a great Monday.